Toxic positivity is how this community has gotten to this point. It's time to try honest, open conversation. We reject those telling us to work with people who have lied to and about us, our members, our leaders, and the organization's racial justice work. We challenge those individuals to solicit some feedback from culturally, culturally competent white allies. Our community urgently requires white people proclaiming positivity to consider who you are silencing. It's not us. Black children are separated from their mothers. Black people are being harmed and black families are being disenfranchised. These are not positive things, but they must be talked about to change them. White people need to gain some self-awareness of the harm making such statements from a place of white or class privilege does. Calls for coming together and public positivity is not the response to credible accounts of race-based harassment and targeting by those employed or elected by the taxpayers. It is yet another manifestation of white privilege. We ask them to consider what black community members might feel when privileged, comfortable white people call for actionless, safe conversations which fail to hold public <coughs> servants accountable for wrongdoing. We will not come together with men who have lied to our faces, expressed openly racist values, used racist microaggressions and tropes when explaining their values, and tried to intimidate and harass journalists into not reporting on concerns raised about discrimination. They have repeatedly misrepresented their actions to the public. They appear to prefer using disruption tactics to thwart true accountability and restorative justice by giving verbal assurances to those raising concerns. Verbal assurances are enough for many white people who prefer a comfortable salve which soothes white feelings while actually doing nothing to help black people suffering these crimes and indignities. City and community leaders serious about racial justice must address the absent, underperforming, or outright broken structures of local government and public service. This is the only path to begin to bring true reconciliation, restorative justice, and healing to this community. Those telling us that discussions are sufficient to solve complex structural racism do not understand the intractable pervasive problem. For far too many in our community and some who have left, complaints of maltreatment are met with retaliation and further trauma. At our last town hall, we read an interview summary of likely police misconduct during an incident of an innocent black man being allegedly assaulted in his girlfriend's private residence by the police. It appears to have been a case of mistaken identity, shortly after which the Macomb Police Department's website and complaint form became non-functioning. Both the chief and sheriff were on that call, yet neither reported their errors nor made any attempt at helping this traumatized man and his family receive proper acknowledgement, support, and public witness to the wrongs done to them by our police. We wish to point out that once the complaint form was fixed after many requests, the complaint form required a notarized signature. We have an email from the mayor confirming that the form they put up required a notarized signature. We have posted a screenshot of it on our Facebook wall. We will share it with any members of the media who wish to verify that Mayor Inman told our organization that a notarized signature was required by law. We asked the Macomb Police to amend that form at our last town hall so as to adopt best practices standards. We weren't informed when they updated the form, but in several meetings since, Police Chief Kurt Parker has misled the community in those meetings in his official capacity, claiming that our assertion that the form required a notarized signature was a rumor which he knows is not a rumor, but was the truth based upon the mayor's email. The fact they have since changed it doesn't mean it was rumor ever. A police chief who will deliberately mislead the public, community leaders, and the press regarding police handling of complaints is displaying inappropriate, unprofessional behavior at best. At this time, we renew our call for Chief Barker to step down or be removed and for his department to be properly investigated. We're going to go on to read some affidavits, but there is a content warning. The following affidavits and witness summaries contain language and detailed crimes and failures to protect, which are sensitive and may be traumatizing for viewers watching our live feed and here with us tonight. We're going to start with Becky Danner reading an affidavit of a pregnant black WIU student arrested for fearfully asking for help. <laughs>
This is an, is an account of an incident involving the Macomb police arresting a black pregnant man. 2016, there was an altercation between two drivers. I was sitting in the passenger seat of one vehicle. The officer came to my window, cussing at me, telling me to, quote, roll down the effing window, end quote. When I told him that I couldn't, because the car had already been turned off, he told me to, quote, open the effing door. I complied, and he forcefully pulled me out of the car and slammed me on it multiple times, knowing that I was pregnant, because I had informed him repeatedly. I then stepped away from the car with my hands up to try to show I was no threat. The officer then put his hands on his taser and ordered me to the ground. I then called 911 because I believed at this point that my unborn's life was in danger and I didn't feel safe. Another officer came and ripped my phone away from my hand and slammed it hard on the windshield of the car. The officer was manhandling me, then put me in the back of his car. I asked what I was being arrested for and received no answer. When I asked to talk to another officer, I was told that his car had audio and video and that if I had anything to say, I could say it to him. Racial justice interviewer note, the car audio and video somehow was apparently destroyed, so it couldn't be used to help with this case in court. This was after already being told by that same officer that I didn't have a right to remain silent. I was never read my rights. When I got to the jail, the man who was booking me didn't even know what I was being arrested for. The officer knew he was in the wrong, so what he arrested me for was falsifying a report because I dialed 911 on him, claiming I just could have talked to another officer on the scene. I did ask to speak to an, another officer and was ignored. The only person arrested from that incident, I was the only person arrested from that incident. I ended up charged with the misdemeanor that remains on my record. I was assigned a public defender, but I don't even believe he cared about my case. The second affidavit will be read by Heather McNeekin from a black mom rendered unconscious in the McDonough County Jail. This is an account of an incident involving the Macomb Police, the Sheriff's Department, and McDonough County Jail. The interviewee reported being pulled over by the police. She is disabled and blind in one eye. She stated she saw the police car and turned off the main road, expecting the police car to be on their way to a call. Once that didn't happen, she looked for a good place to pull over. Once stopped, the interviewee stated that officers approached the car, possibly one on each side of the car, and the officer on the driver's side, shining his light in her face. She reports that she raised her hand to block the light. She was asking why she was pulled over when the officer began to remove her from the vehicle. She ended up on the ground very quickly. Again, she's a petite woman weighing 130 pounds. Interviewee reports waking up in a holding cell after the booking. She relates that she woke up in a shirt and panties and that was so cold that her legs were green, an indication of some type of shock and maybe hypothermia. She called out for help. She believed herself so cold she was in danger. An Racial Justice Coalition interview, we know this may have been shock from being injured, head injury, and multiple taser contacts. It appears this was used to interpret that she was a danger to herself and was dressed in the suit, clothing, restrictive wear appropriate for a suicide risk. She wasn't given anything to warm herself and reports remaining very cold during this time. She was sent to processing and awakened to find a four to six centimeter raised obvious soft tissue injury on the left side of her frontal forehead. We have pictures of all these injuries. There are four to five taser marks on her back and another one on her arm. She displayed multiple bruises, including one large deep bruise on her forearm, which may have been the result of an initial taser attempt because of the single mark in the center that matches the other taser marks. She reports no apparent medical attention being offered or given. Her economic situation means she has been unable to afford to be seen herself. 
interviewee appears to be receiving pressure to accept a plea deal which would deprive the court of reviewing the evidence of what happened in jail to her she relates ongoing headaches signs of trauma since and will also state that whenever somebody is rendered unconscious in a jail they should always be taken especially following a closed head injury they should always be taken up to appropriate medical condition there is no other way to rule out closed head injury that could be life-threatening she may have sustained a traumatic brain injury and received absolutely no help whatsoever the next affidavit will be read by Verna Perkins it's from a black mother who submitted a complaint against an officer who called her a black bitch affidavit affidavit number three black mother submitted a complaint against officer who called her a black bitch I went into the police department Macomb Illinois to file a complaint on an officer who called me a black bitch after I filed a complaint I was contacted by sergeant butcher in two hours later asking me if I could come in for an in-person interview to discuss the complaint that I had just the that I just had the minute I agreed they came and picked me up at my home I sat down with sergeant butcher and another detective who I could recognize if I see him and before they clicked on the microphone the detective informed me there for me there he would hate for this to end up back for me and shall services to be notified or the housing authorities to be notified or DCFS to be notified or the Department of Human Services to be notified after he stated that to me I told him that my story will still be the same he commenced with the interview clicked on the microphone and I say aware of where I wrote down on my complaint after he clicked on the microphone I repeated my statement that I have written down nearly word-for-word the interview lasted about 30 to 40 minutes and then they dropped me back at home on Wheeler Street I walked into my home grabbed my child I walked out to the bus stop and I caught the bus to Walmart so I could pick up dinner for my kids I got a message from my boyfriend at that time telling me that the sheriff's department had just left my home with my picture and I now had a $50,000 warrant arrest for my arrest it seems a detective and sergeant butcher ran my name to find out if I had any open cases or pending cases they found that I had a domestic dispute that was open but not brought to the police department because there were no charges found to give me at the time so they appear to have gotten the state's attorney to pick it up took it to a judge who signed a warrant and then had the Illinois State Police come and look for me on that warrant all within an hour of me leaving the station after filing the complaint all of this as a result of me filing my complaint against a fellow Macomb Police Department officer this nearly instant retaliation because of this I faced 40 days in jail 40 nights in jail I was also placed on a GPS monitor I was not able to care for my children and I also was sentenced to two and a half years probation with over three thousand dollars in court fees and fines that I'm still currently paying to this day the next affidavit will be read by Candace Whitman Macomb Police Department's refusal to take report of a red truck attempting to run her daughter off the road okay so the first vehicle incident was in 2017 where the interviewee reports that her daughter reported a red truck that attempted to drive the mother's daughter off the road the daughter reported it to the police with a description of the vehicle and the police refused to take a report at first the mother tried to implore the police to investigate the interviewee stated the family gave up trying to get the police's assistance and the police did nothing about it then there was a second vehicle incident 
and the interviewee states that her daughter and her daughter's fiance reported this incident to her shortly after it happened. The interviewee states her daughter and her fiance said they were walking to catch the Go West stop by Walmart. They told her they noticed a pickup truck and even made eye contact with the driver. They reported the driver then intentionally sped up and tried to run into them. The fiance injured his hand trying to create distance between the truck and the mother's daughter. The mother said the fiance had to push her daughter out of the way to prevent her from being hit by the vehicle. The interviewee stated the incident wasn't reported because they no longer have trust in the police department to do anything about these incidents after being repeatedly turned down by the Macomb Police Department for requests for assistance. The next affidavit will be read by Heather, MPD, Macomb Police Department's refusal to call for qualified medical professionals for a traumatized black girl. Mr. Coach, may you? No, you're welcome. Come on in. There's cookies right there. Help yourself. This references an account of a um, preteen black girl with a history of PTSD. Um, one evening, the daughter was struggling with affect dysregulation issues from PTSD following yet another incident at school in which the child was allegedly told by some white students to kill herself. The mother called for an ambulance and specifically asked for medical personnel instead of the police to respond. The mother had gone into the bathroom after making the call, knowing that she would not be able to go for a while, and when she returned to her living room, she was shocked to discover that a blonde woman in plain clothes had entered her home uninvited. The woman refused to identify herself by name, only stating she was a ride-along. The officers, Macomb police officers, refused to identify her, only stating that she was a ride-along. The mother asked the unknown ride-along to exit her residence. Only the police arrived, no medical personnel. Macomb Police Department officers repeatedly refused to call for EMS personnel to do a medical evaluation, insisting that only the police officers would deal with her family and if she wanted to go to the hospital, she, they would have to put her in the back of their police car. The mother reports this caused escalation of the girl's terror and trauma. The mother agreed to allow the police to transport rather than further delay and further traumatize her daughter but related that she felt she had no other choice. The mother left her home after 10 minutes or so after the police so she could gather some necessities before heading to the hospital. When the mother arrived at the hospital, the worker at the front desk repeatedly claimed that her child wasn't at the hospital and would give no further information about the whereabouts of her child. The mother reported that the front desk worker was very unfriendly, short, and refused to answer any questions. The mother and the family gathered in the waiting room, repeatedly begging the hospital staff to let them know where their disabled minor child had been taken. The mother reportedly asked for a hospital administrator. Once she spoke to the hospital administrator, the front desk worker admitted the child had been there all along but that the police said they weren't permitted to see the child. For another hour or so, the mother stayed distraught in the waiting room. She was reported feeling distressed, confused, and crying. She reports confusion, hurt, and feelings of horror and shame that the hospital would not allow her to see and comfort her own child. The mother reports that the police officers handed her a form and told her she had to sign it. It was a form to relinquish her parental rights and give her daughter over as a ward of the court. When she refused to sign it, the officer demanded she sign the form or that he would sign it for her. When the mother demanded more answers, the nurses said they were told by the officer that she had said she didn't want to see her child. MDH staff told the scared and confused child that, their mo that her mother did not wish to see her, which was not at all accurate and which traumatized both child and family. The mother also reports that the child had repeatedly asked for period products for over four hours, and the hospital staff kept forgetting. 
leaving her without them, feeling ashamed and humiliated in the ER. After they finally allowed the mother to be with her child, the mother asked the hospital for pads and a comb. They gave the child pads, but the white staffer claimed that the combs they had would not fit through the child's hair, so refused this black child a comb based on their cultural ignorance. As a result, the mother had to comb her child's hair with a fork. As hair combing is an affect regulation mindfulness exercise which brings her daughter comfort and helps her self-regulate. The mother relayed that every time the police have to be called in these incidents, they refuse to even call an ambulance when the mother has specifically requested that her child be taken by qualified medical professionals who are caring and well-trained in an ambulance. The mother said that she and her child are so traumatized that they hesitate to call, call or go to the hospital for anything. I will read the next affidavit titled Possible Victim of Hate Crime, Excessive Force, Obstruction of Justice at Walmart. It was an early morning when the interviewee was at Walmart. She stated she heard a commotion and recognized one of the voices as her neighbor. She reports her male neighbor is older and disabled but describes him as kind and helpful. She approached him and said he seemed calm. Other bystanders warned her not to go near him allegedly because he had a knife. The interviewee saw no weapon. She reports she engaged in a normal conversation with the man as a cashier finished serving him. Suddenly, police were surrounding them with their guns drawn. She believes she witnessed the police escalate what had been a calm situation. She describes the memory as traumatic, shocking, and frightening as it put her and the others' lives needlessly at risk. She believes that the police used excessive force to restrain the elderly disabled man. She protested that the police were not doing their job and escalating an issue that was already de-escalated. She states the police knew the man as they have had incidents with him in the past, so they arrived on the scene fully aware of his disabilities. The mother said several witnesses, some of whom are employees of Walmart, approached her and said they saw the elderly man enter the bathroom and leave with a swollen, bloody eye. The employees also relayed that Walmart and the police advised them not to give any statements about the incident threatening their jobs. Racial Justice Coalition notes. Members of the man's family, church, and Racial Justice Coalition members have twice attempted to watch the proceedings against this man in court, only to have the court move the man's hearing up several hours, denying them an opportunity to learn how this case is proceeding. We have discussed the event with several other witnesses who have relayed that they believe this man was the possible victim of a hate crime from a white man with an anecdotal history of provocation of marginalized persons who may have provoked him into an altercation in the bathroom. It appears that white man did not want to file charges, but the police and state's attorney appear to have escalated the charges regardless of the white man's wishes. We have gathered anecdotal accounts that some witnesses may have had their jobs threatened by both Macomb Police Department and possibly their employer should they give witness statements, which would clarify the facts surrounding the arrest, which appears to have been excessive force and possibly implicate Macomb Police Department in a possible obstruction of justice to keep the facts from being heard in the man's defense. Furthermore, his being held away from his family for so long with repeated continuances appears to follow an emerging troubling pattern of black people being held longer to possibly pressure them into accepting bad plea agreements to move their cases forward into resolution, even if detrimental and unwarranted based upon the alleged crime. And our last affidavit will be read by Candace Whitman, black man fired from housing following racial insult from Executive Director Bill Jacobs, harassment by Macomb Police Department Officer Lindsey May. This is a direct quote from this individual. In 2017, I was employed at McDonough County Housing Authority for maintenance and grounds. I arrived at work and Bill Jacobs spoke empathetically at me, get your black ass in here. My immediate supervisor sent me back to work while he was going to speak with Mr. Jacobs. Three hours later, Bill Jacobs called me into the office. There were two Macomb police officers there. 
He fired me, claiming I had taken an unscheduled break. He also tried to kick me off the proper entirely, but it was informed by the staff he couldn't do that as that was my residence. The person working under Bill Jacobs at that time told me Officer Lindsay May was trying to get me fired, trying to get me thrown out of housing, and she informed me that I was not safe from him and that she believed my life was at risk from the police and that I should move for my safety. Since the first round of affidavits read at our last town hall, our organization has received no request at all, nor communication from Mayor Inman, Chief Barker, nor Sheriff Pettigrew. Given the potential legal and economic implications for the consequences of not investigating credible allegations, much less addressing these concerns, we find the city's apparent lack of interest and attention in these matters appalling at best. We speak now to the white community members of Macomb who may be watching this event online. How many affidavits will it take? How many accounts detailing the pain, suffering, and trauma experienced by members of the black community must be laid bare for the voyeuristic consumption and rejection by white community members? How many black people must stand alone before those who consider themselves good people finally respond with demands for an investigation and appropriate change? 10 families harmed, 20 families harmed, 50? We easily estimate that these types of incidents have cost this city literally dozens of black families who have fled here for their lives, and they use that language repeatedly. Why is one clear injustice not enough for white people to demand action for change instead of conversation? We challenge all our community members to step up in their personal racial justice awareness to move beyond book discussions and conversations by tasking all our community leaders to address structural and systemic bias in policing at all levels, in busing here in Macomb. That includes adherence to all IEPs and Title IX rights, a demand for second adults to ride along, and to investigate the comments made by Anthony Reed to parents. And we wish to call out a tactic to help um, parents suffering with problems on the bus. One of the things that we keep hearing is that the parents call up the bus garage supervisor and are told, and aren't, they never get back to them. They wait about two weeks, and after that, the recordings are gone. And then they say, well, you should have called us sooner. And that has, that has been a pattern that has been repeated, and some of our members have had that happen to them as well. So we recommend, if you have problems with your child on the buses in Macomb schools, that you put a written request to the school board and Superintendent Toomey and the bus garage, and you demand that they preserve the bus evidence, the video evidence, and you copy your request in writing to some of the press so that they can follow through. We think that is the best way to try to interrupt that disruption. In the schools, we have a petition that's been out there for a while. Uh, we'll post that online for our asks again. In places of employment, getting the Equal Opportunity and Fair Housing Commission to be functional again and hear discrimination committees in our city is an urgent need and it should be happening already. We've been waiting for over seven months since we first went in and asked. We have not received the basic answers to our questions on why it's not functioning. Our, our research team uh, coordinated through several of our subcommittees and they have identified a timeline that is very problematic. That timeline has been shared with the ACLU of Illinois. It's been shared with the Department of Justice. It has been also been shared with um, the Illinois Attorney General, and it outlines a pattern of people nicely asking Macomb to please address systemic racism here repeatedly over the last 20 years, going before the city council, speaking to the mayor, writing letters to the editor, and we have that account, and eventually it will appear in the paper for all the world to see, and we think you all will find uh, ample 
examples of many, many good-hearted people asking nicely for these things to be addressed. And that's why we are now doing it this way, appealing to authority outside our community because none of those requests were achieved the desired results. Also in places of employment, we need, uh, another thing that we've identified, we have some city leaders who call up places of employment um, that are funded by tax dollars, and they will just state that they don't care for that particular person who just happens to be black, and they don't think that person should be employed. We have directed those agencies that have reached out to us about what to do about that, and this is our recommendation. Every public agency in this community, which in this county, which in any way receives federal or state or local funds, should institute immediately a call log. Time, date, who called, what they asked, what they were told, who took the call and why, and then those would be subject to FOIA, and then that could end the nonsense of certain community leaders calling up and saying, for instance, this was one call we took. One community leader called up housing and said, well, you know, I want to ask about that black man who has applied. I know that he says he has 10 years of sobriety, but he doesn't look like he's going to stay sober to me. We should deny him housing. In the justice system, we need to establish a watchdog group to witness hearings. We need to establish a jail outreach group. And we need an evaluation system for our local state's attorney and public defenders. And we urge our jail to begin allowing two one-hour visits for families of incarcerated persons who aren't on any restrictions instead of the one 30-minute time slot they get per week, which isn't enough for them to maintain healthy family connections, maintain resiliency, they are isolated, and they do not receive many visitors. Also, we implore the police to set up regular ride-alongs for all of our white community leaders to be allowed. If they are elected officials, they should be permitted to ride along and see how the jobs are done. In the healthcare system, we urgently need to get black community members appointed to the board of McDonough District Hospital, also to North Central Behavioral Health Services, the McDonough County Health Department boards, and we need to require cultural competency training of all hospital employees and implicit bias testing. We have credible allegations and evidence of wrongdoing including possible obstruction of justice against the police chief, sheriff, and sheriff Pettigrew with the full complicity of Mayor Mike Inman for refusing to even listen to us, work with us, or make any attempt to hold any of these people accountable or bring to light, even to hear the evidence. We do not believe these men deserve to stay in leadership in this community. We have many more affidavits coming in the pipeline, and we will keep revealing them to document both the experiences and subsequent refusal to respond by our city leaders. At this time, the Democratic Women of McDonough County calls on Mayor Mike Inman, Chief Kurt Barker, and Sheriff Nick Pettigrew to step down or be removed. Our community deserves leaders in love with justice not reputation-saving optics and false verbal assurances that do nothing to protect the next vulnerable person. We urge all caring citizens concerned with a truly healthy community to demand an investigation into the sheriff's harassment of journalists and elected officials in this county. A sheriff who will use his uniform, badge, and gun to try to intimidate journalists and political opponents isn't just appalling, it erodes faith in government and feelings of community safety and inclusion. There exists a recording of the police chief, Kurt Barker, admitting he knows the sheriff intimidates people, yet Chief Barker has failed to hold him accountable or call for an investigation. This is a violation of the sworn duty to protect in our mind. On Monday night, I went and spoke at the County Board's Law and Legal Committee to ask them to investigate these allegations. Alas, the journalist covering that failed to convey the seriousness of that request 
failing to properly inform the public record in the newspaper article. So we are correcting that this evening. Yes, we have asked for a formal investigation of the county board, I mean by the county board's law and legal committee. The county board must investigate the sheriff and the McDonough County Jail. At that meeting, I asked one question. Most of you who do know me know I am a former paramedic in this community. I was a state EMS instructor. I asked this question of the law and legal committee. Under what circumstances is it ever appropriate for an unconscious person to be denied any appropriate medical aid in the jail? They couldn't answer the question. They hemmed and hawed and they asked, you know, they stated that, well, it would be surely in the handbook. And then our county clerk, Gretchen DeJane, said, no, that is a question for the state's attorney. Let me state clearly. The answer is it is never okay for an unconscious person in our jail in custody to be denied medical care. That is a basic international human right and everyone who is an elected and appointed city official or is paid by tax dollars should know those basic rights, especially those people serving on a committee called the Law and Legal Committee who are supposed to look out for our rights as taxpayers and ensure that all laws are properly followed and procedures. So we think maybe some education might be in order. We urge journalists to speak with the McDonough County Voice editor, Michelle Langout, on the behavior towards her and another journalist by the sheriff. We also think journalists should investigate the statements Mayor Inman has made to the voice editor in regards to several stories the paper posted calling into question the functioning and status of the Equal Opportunity and Fair Housing Commission after we drew attention to its non-functioning status. These men do not have to like the issues we raise, but trying to silence our organization by intimidating and harassing journalists is absolutely unacceptable, is a possible violation of the First Amendment, and must be investigated. Such behavior could even open up both the city and the county to expensive legal action, which we would all pay for and we hope to avoid. An investigation into possible color of law violations for their actions and their repeated failures to protect black people and other people of color in our community from harm and violations of their constitutional, civil, and human rights should be conducted by outside agencies. These allegations are profoundly, deeply serious, and this community should demand answers. Prove us wrong. Prove us wrong with independent investigations or hold these people accountable. Repeated failures on the part of our city and county government to properly investigate and address the concerns raised is appalling and sends a chilling message to people of color here, as do the false assurances of white people who apparently have no black friends to inform them of their ignorance on these matters. At this point, we will say thank you to all of you for coming here tonight. We know you are all here because you are also concerned about this community and the viability of it and its economic survival. All of these things are deeply intertwined. Every black family who leaves here feeling that they were run out is connected to other families. We estimate we have lost dozens of WIU students to these problems that have remained unaddressed for far too long. We are all going down together if we don't start working together, start fixing these problems, educating our public servants, ensuring that all the processes of the laws that are supposed to protect people are functioning properly with transparency and forthrightness and integrity. And furthermore, if we are public servants, and I am an elected public official as well as a precinct committee person for the Democratic Party of McDonough County, we all have an obligation uh, to all of our constituents to take any questions that they may have of us and to answer those and to not marginalize them, to not try to get the press to stop asking those questions or reporting on those things. 
Let's start doing it better. We already know what best practices look like, and it begins with actually acknowledging that harm has been done instead of denying it or ignoring it as what has been happening. Now at this point, we'll open up the floor to questions or if anybody would like to share their concerns. This mic is open for you. And I will state that we, we owe a real debt of gratitude to our mentor, Dr. Essie Rutledge. Um, she has helped us immeasurably, tirelessly over the past year, helping us understand because those of us with white privilege, we have a lot of learning to do. We need to know what to look for. Things happen in front of us that we just don't see until it's pointed out to us. That, many of us have been guilty of doing as well. And the answer is, you know, all of us white people in a white majority community have internalized racism and white supremacy, and it is not something to be ashamed of. We come by it honestly because we were taught not to talk about it. But it is urgently necessary that we not only talk about it, but we listen, hear, and believe even when our minds tell us that the people that are good to our faces may be not the same people to them. All the students who have reached out to us, we want to speak specifically to WIU students. We believe you. We care. We are working on this in our community. Please don't give up on us. We know WIU is working hard on these issues too, and we have many, many good people who are working hard to come together from wherever they are. We applaud all efforts, even conversations, aimed at trying to get people comfortable talking about this. But that is not where this organization is. We are one of the most diverse, if not the most diverse org in McDonough County, and we have a large membership. We have over 90 some members just in this city alone, and they work in all these agencies. And, men, and we have many black members, we have family members who are black, friends who are black, Asian, Hispanic, Latino. We believe them and we see how they get treated when we are with them. We hear our leaders saying racist microaggressions and most of the white people listening to them don't even realize that's happening. But it is deeply offensive and we need to start making them aware, excuse me, what you just said was really hurtful and this is why and we need to do better. So we invite everybody uh, to please go home, discuss what you heard, talk about what your values are, reach out to black community members, to our Hispanic and Latino community members, our international students. They need to know from people other than just us, that there are people who get it, who get that it's about more than just having conversations about how to be anti-racist. It is about actually being anti-racist. That's what this is about, and our actions are about that, and we are not gonna apologize for being passionate about these issues. It is our friends, family, community members being hurt. And if they won't listen, we will just keep talking and expanding our circle outward to appeal to people outside this community who get it. Because we have to fix this. We understand that we are not alone in this. We are in a, you know, in a very conservative, very white community. We are grappling with these issues. But when the story breaks about the equal opportunity and fair housing, it will include several accounts of attempts by black people over the years to try to get groups of white people to get together to discuss and work on these issues and coalitions. And those always fell apart due to the leadership in City Hall not pushing the issue and the leadership at the county level failing repeatedly. Those things are over. We are here to make sure that this effort continues and we invite all to come with us. You don't have to like us. You don't have to believe us. We ask that you listen and then prove us wrong. Thank you so much for being here tonight. We will be announcing our next town hall. Um, go ahead. Well, I have an observation. This is a failure partly of the political process. I just looked at a sample ballot. I think the sheriff, was, the sheriff 
I don't know, oh, the state's attorney is up this November, doesn't have an opponent. These people are running without opponents. It's a failure. This is a failure of the political process when these people run for office without opponents. I'm just looking at a sample ballot and I saw a lot of people that don't have any opponents. That's really sad. We need to find people to run against these people, if, you know, and can call them out in a political campaign. Thank you. That's Erin Hopkins. She is president of the Illinois ACLU out of Peoria. That's right. Uh, Heather, just uh, one question. Uh, are there more specifics on these affidavits? Are yes. Dates? Absolutely. Officers. We are protecting their identities for fear of further retaliation against them, but absolutely. All the specifics have already been given to the ACLU um, and already been given to the Illinois Attorney General and are being sent to the Department of Justice and the Illinois Department of Human Rights. And we also have connected some people to human rights lawyers because they need them. But yes, all those details are far more specific and will come out with a proper investigation. So the, the people that uh, are uh, lodging these complaints are not too intimidated or too afraid to name names and to cite dates and times and not with, mm -hmm. uh, well, they, they're terrified. Like, yeah, Let, let's be clear, they're all scared to death. Right. It's very hard to, I mean, they're giving us these initial complaints, but the actual number of affidavits that we can get them to sign yeah. is very low mm -hmm. because they are scared. Yeah. Right. So, um, yes, we have their names, but the ones. I, I think you'll agree. The ones that are actually going to the Attorney General's office and everywhere like that is not going to be anywhere near the number that have actually spoken to us. Well, hopefully, in the future, these uh, marginalized people will feel that they get a little support from the white community. Yeah. That most yeah. of the people in this county, I feel, do have a, a good sense of justice mm -hmm. and racial justice and probably want to do the right thing. We agree. We think most of our community will respond. And I think this is this forum is a, a good probably start, at least for uh, addressing these issues. You know, I applaud uh, what uh, all the ladies in the uh, uh, the county Democrats have um, have done so far, and uh, I, I appreciate the fact that you're raising these issues that should make us all think. And that's uh, that's 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 to be commended. Thank you. That was Dick Marcotte, uh, the McDonough County board member. He's also a precinct committee person in the McDonough County Democratic Party. We do believe that most of our community members, when they become aware of this, they will respond and be outraged and distraught as we have been, um, trying to move. And let me let me remind people how we do affidavits. To be clear, we do not read any affidavits that we don't believe we have the evidence to hold up in court. Okay, through an investigation. They first come in to us and are usually they are referred uh, from a friend or family member who often knows one of us and usually it ends up being me because I just like worked in the biggest uh, employers, I guess, over the years in McDonough County, so I'm pretty visible. But then I do an initial contact with them and often it's through a text message and then um, we have a discussion on the phone and if they seem like they are willing to meet, then we'll set up a meeting in a public place with at least two of our Racial Justice Coalition members. And then we, the first pass, we do not press them for clarification on details. These people are very traumatized and we conduct all interviews with a trauma-informed lens which means we don't prod, we don't try to figure out when there's discrepancies. That's what an investigation is for. On the first pass, and when you're doing this work, and we invite other people who are concerned to try to take this work on, I will tell you, this work absolutely transforms you as a white person in this community. It causes you to deeply change how you see your friends and family and the interactions every day. We go from meeting with people who are so beaten down and it felt so marginalized and invisible, like they aren't even human, that often they can't even look us in the eye. And as we sit there with them using a trauma-informed approach, um, just listening with compassion and care, you watch their 
affect change. And they begin to open up and they look up and they realize they've been seen by someone who sees them, who doesn't look like them, but looks like us. And often they will cry and they will, we give that we, the first thing we do is establish safety. We make sure that we put them in contact with good mental health professionals who are trauma-informed and culturally competent. And let me, as an aside, state that the mental health opportunities for this community, uh, for people of color, are abysmally awful. Most of the mental health community uh, members are not culturally competent. They are not what we would call woke. They have not had implicit bias training enough um, and unfortunately, they sometimes even state racist microaggressions, even when they're conducting them, which, which doesn't help trust. So a lot of training is necessary, right? And I don't think that's confined to just it's, the black people. Mm -hmm. It's also Gay. a socioeconomic problem as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Yeah. But tonight is about the communities of color and their needs, because we will have other time calls to address, um, you know, the, the poverty issues and such. But just as an aside, we have a, a local woman who is now a trauma therapist who is trying to raise funds to be able to establish a trauma-informed, multicultural mental health practice here in this community. For the last, has it been like three weeks we've been trying to help fundraise? So um, to put it in context, she is black, and she is actually a member of a police family here, a black police family. Um, she's only raised, I think, the last time I looked, $325 for that effort. By comparison, when the new police canine needed a vest, this community raised, what, twelve or $14,000 in a weekend to be able to get that dog a vest because, you know, the canine police dog has the community support but actually bring in a multicultural health practice that would have scholarships for the impoverished people who can't afford it, we can't get people to donate. So that just kind of tells you what we're facing in our community. It is an intractable problem. And uh, if you would like to know how to donate to that, then we will make sure that that information is up on our website as well. But then there's the other side of, you know, if people associate themselves with us, then they lose community support because a lot of our, and I'm calling out my party members here, our white liberals who have written letters telling us to be quiet, saying that, they're, that they don't consider us truly democratic women, that they don't consider themselves our types of liberals or that they're not, um, we are not Democrats like those people, right? We see you. And guess what? What do you think that says to the black people who we are standing up for when you make comments like that in public and post them on social media? You know, as Democrats and liberals, we should be better, right? We shouldn't be writing letters calling for public positivity. We should be calling for eloquence and gentleness and, and nice teaching. When we have community leaders who are corrupt, when we have credible evidence of wrongdoing and harassment and intimidation, the issue is not to help them be less corrupt or learn on the job, they just need to go. We need to get better people elected. You are absolutely right, and I'll tell you what, we have tried for a year to get people to run, but you all have seen how we get treated just trying to stand up for black people here who have been assaulted. Um, anyone who puts themselves out there to run ends up getting mistreated. Uh, people call them homophobic slurs. I mean, it's just, we, we have a lot of problems, but tonight is solely about the racial justice issue. It is our racial justice coalition. We would like to thank the ACLU of Illinois, uh, Peoria chapter, for making the trip over here and uh, helping us bring attention to these issues. Sunlight really is the best disinfectant and we call on the good nature of the good people in this community, regardless of how you may feel about me or any of our leadership team or our organization, if you really care, your feelings about us wouldn't matter. If you really intended to do something, you would be doing it already, right? And I'm not speaking to the people in this room, but for those watching from home, those people who really want racial justice are already doing the work. Um, they're not using an excuse like, well, you should have someone other than that Heather McMeekin come and then maybe I'll help. That, 
that is part of a premise that says, oh, I'm a good person, but it's that Heather McMeekin stopping me from acting. We're calling out that premise. You don't get to own that. You don't get to blame me for doing nothing, all right? From now on, this community owns it all. And to be clear, the Democratic Women of McDonough County is all our members. Yes. Heather is not the Democratic Women of McDonough County. We all stand with her. We are all behind her, and we all do this work. We have all taken affidavits. We have all met with these people, and we are all behind everything that Heather does and that we all do. This is not Heather's organization. This is all our organization, all of our members. And all of us would say, we are behind our work. You want to add anything? Feel free. I'll just second that, what, uh, what Gina just said in that. Um, this is it's something that I've heard many times of like complaints about uh, people suggesting that that this organization is just really just Heather um, and that is not at all the case. Um, I am a licensed clinical mental a licensed clinical professional counselor and um, I see issues with my clients and I also see issues that are happening with people in the community where we're taking affidavits and um, we I as a professional counselor 100% um, agree with the work that uh, this agency is doing. But I will say that Heather does a lot of work and she does it well. Everybody, that's a wrap. Please eat cookies. We don't want to take them oh, home. One thing, Heather, Go ahead, Michael. I got a call from Chairman um, Schwerer today who told me that he is going to do an investigation. Thank you. Yay. So, uh, Thank you, Chairman Scott Schwerer. Woo! Investigation and, uh, into what, Michael? But I will also, as a fellow Democrat, be honest with you that I get the impression that they're kind of siding with the sheriff's position that um, you've said, prove us wrong. Deputy Kramer said to me, well, we'll prove you wrong. So I think this will go that. to Do court. Yeah. I, that's where I see this going. So I hope that we can improve uh, the way law enforcement is done in this community. I really do. I tend to believe that some of these depositions are probably accurate, but you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to win it legally because I don't think just the pressure of the Democratic minority in the county board is gonna get the job done. Well, and that's why we're not just relying on the Democratic pressure in the county board, that's why we're uh, appealing to outside agencies to compel these investigations forward. But um, it does have to begin with a complaint from within and where we have, you know, initially last summer we just thought, oh, well, the Macomb Police Department website isn't functional, I know how to help that. Let's just, and then they didn't have a link. And then we sent many people to ask them, why is there no link for a complaint form? And depending on who was asking the question, they got several different answers. We thought, well, that's really odd. So we looked up what best practices would be. And we discovered that our police are not following those. So then we met with the mayor and Alderwoman Carper um, and asked them for that. And they pretty much said that they weren't going to do anything on our list. Um, and that they wouldn't work with us, and they were happy to work just with the multicultural center and the people that they've chosen, which is not our org, of course. And so after, and then we still keep getting told, well, just go talk to them. We did. <laughs> they took, oh, okay, sorry, go ahead, Dick. No, I didn't have anything to say. Oh, sorry. I thought you wanted to know, which I do too. They're going to investigate, start an investigation on what? Exactly. On the sheriff. What I asked for was that they investigate the allegations against the sheriff's intimidation of public officials, um, journalists, and then also, also possible First Amendment violations for trying to suppress our organization's voice. Okay. And the jail. Anything else? I would like to know though, there is five of us here, so board members. Thank you. When you came in, I had. I'm the chair of Law and Legal. You completely shocked me because we hadn't heard a thing. Yeah. Nothing has been said to us, and I don't like being blamed for something that I knew nothing about. 
Well, so we try to encourage people to go directly to you. They felt that they were not safe doing so. Well, and, and for legal, we have, we have, the person has to come to us. I understand. So this is a problem, right? Because there's no black people on the county board or on that law or legal committee. I mean, I'm sorry. On the, on the, it's a free world. Anybody right. can run. Exactly. Anybody can run, and we are trying to encourage people to run. Um, but, you know, and again, we don't blame the Law and Legal Committee for not knowing about it if nobody's brought that to you. So, and I don't mean to suggest that you haven't done your job on complaints you don't know about. I'm saying that the process, uh, the police have so managed to marginalize and terrorize the black community and people of color here that they are so fearful of even trying to marshal a complaint because of the retaliation. And we have many, many, many anecdotal accounts of retaliation. We have other affidavits of retaliation we're working on. They have legitimate reason to fear, not just for their safety, but for loss of their children, for loss of their housing, loss of their jobs, loss of their lives. It is asking a lot of marginalized persons to overcome that, to go to predominantly white people and ask them to do better when they have tried and nothing has happened. I would also state that it would be great if the Sheriff's Department would put a decent complaint form up on their website as an intake form, but that, those complaint forms should just go through the Sheriff. They should go through your committee as well. There is a way to make those complaint forms forward to multiple emails. There is literally no reason why, with just, and I'd be happy to code that out for you in about five minutes, to be able to make those complaint forms, everything that comes through goes to every one of you on that law and legal committee so that you all see the incoming and then you can kind of track how people are treated all the way through that process. I would also like to add that um, if people don't know that they can come to you, then they're not going to come to you. Um, so I think it's really important to, to think about like what the, like the, the marginalized members of the community, do they know that you exist? That I didn't. That you exist and that that is the purpose for your committee. And do they know that you're safe? It, I think they need to know that if they come to you with this complaint, that they're not going to be retaliated against. And when there are members of the um, sheriff's department sitting in the meetings, when they're complaining about the sheriff's department, how are they going to feel? There's no way that they're going to feel safe enough to make a complaint. Um, and, and not fear retaliation. And I think that we've, we've heard enough from um, members of the community that have said that they've experienced retaliation. So they have um, every reason to believe that they aren't safe to do that. So um, I appreciate that you're here tonight and I would encourage you to take this back to the committee and to ask what can we do to make sure that the community members know that we exist and that we um, are here to serve this purpose and how can we as a committee make sure that these uh, people who need, uh, need our services are actually safe and they know they're safe. And we would like to acknowledge and thank you for coming here tonight. Um, we, we absolutely believe that you do care about these issues. We are happy to help make people aware of what avenues are open to them, but we can't do that until we have an assurance of safety for the people bringing those things to you. So um, hopefully by midsummer, we're anticipating being able to do a lot of tabling. It would be a great idea to develop some type of maybe brochure or such, uh, so that when people are canvassing, it's election season, both parties could canvass with it and just make sure everyone receives a copy of all the proper way of submitting complaints, but then also the phone numbers of the people in leadership on those committees so that if they do feel in any way that they've been retaliated against or disrespected, they know who to go to. Um, and this is sort of a failure, and this is my party's failure too. You know, we have not done a good job educating our citizenry how to be aware of where you can go for complaints, what is the proper process for submitting those, how do you ensure integrity and uh, transparency, and then what do you do if you feel like something has gone wrong. So we all own this. This isn't on your committee. This isn't on the county board. This is literally on every single person with privilege in this community who needs to step up 
take responsibility to learn how to help our neighbors and friends and then become our own resource to the people in our circle. So when they bring something to us, we can say, oh, I know who you can talk to. Let's go talk to Dick Marcotte. He's a great guy. He cares about this stuff. And I'll go with you. I second that. <laughs> Absolutely. Without question. Anything else? So we commit to working on these issues, to moving forward, to hopefully moving into what we would call restorative justice actions. Uh, we would encourage everybody here to strengthen your personal circle, expand it out, and try to have deeper conversations and show support for our black community members. Just doing that would really begin to open up some eyes because when you have black friends who trust you and you watch them get mistreated repeated, like we can't do an event and keep our black members safe from racist microaggressions. They volunteer, we can't stop them from being mistreated right in front of us. And often the white people doing it have no idea how offensive they're being. And then they're like, well, these people are here to volunteer. Do I make an issue of it now? Or do we just subject them to it silently, hope they can process it, and then you know, be like, well, it's one other thing that wraps up in their trauma list that our community is doing to them that they have no fix for. So we are gonna to continue to work on these issues. <coughs> all right, thank you all so very much, appreciate it.